And just to put this into perspective, we are now joined by Dr. Kamene Kimenye, the head of National Tuberculosis, Leprosy and Lung Disease Program. Welcome to Citizen Extra. Thank you for making the time for us. Now, in as much as you know, this treatment should be free of charge, this study is describing the cost implication as a catastrophic. Yes, um, we do have free treatment mm -hmm. for TB. Mm -hmm both for TB, which is drug sensitive, and for TB that is drug resistant. Mm -hmm. The government provides that for free. However, when you come to taking care of patients, treatment for TB patients requires not just giving the drugs, but also the patient needs to come to hospital. The patient will require to be diagnosed, and then the patient requires the treatment. And the frequency of visiting a healthcare facility also increases the cost. So for example, when we talk about the drug resistant TB patients, at the time the study was done, we were costing that we were doing we were having the treatment duration for 20 months. Mm -hmm. So the patient would have to be injected for 8 months, which means that needs a healthcare worker who is qualified to carry out an injection. So the patient has therefore to come to their healthcare facility on a daily basis for that injection. If the patient is too sick or due to distance uh, distance too far from the facility, the healthcare worker would have to visit the patient. Or there was all those costs. Imagine if you lived, for example, in Kawangware and you needed to come to Kenyatta every single day. The transport cost would, would be very high. In addition, uh, a lot of patients, therefore, will also lose jobs because you cannot be coming to work every day after turn. As you know, when you go to hospital, you have to queue, mm -hmm. wait for your turn. So there's a lot of time that is spent while you're waiting for that injection. So a lot of p patients lost jobs and they would not be able to maintain that kind of cost. TB is considered a wasting disease. In other words, it will help you lose weight when you are or having tuberculosis. A lot of our patients had very low weight. I'm sure that will also come up later. And that means there's a higher cost for food. Mm -hmm. Another issue is that TB is more common among the poor or the people with low income status. Mm -hmm. What that means, therefore, is these people do not have adequate money, first of all, to run their households. Mm -hmm. So that cost increases for them also. So that is um, the, main cost of trans the main cost of food, mm -hmm. cost of transport. And also during that time when you're waiting to start treatment, you will buy cough syrup here. Tomorrow you'll go and see uh, a, a dispensary and there'll be a consultation cost. And by the time the treatment is completed, you have already cost, uh, taken care of a lot of costs. Mm -hmm. After treatment, you may have post-TB complications. And therefore, like some of our patients, develop complications of breathing. Others, due to side effects of drugs, cannot hear. And for that reason, they need now to go for rehabilitation, learn new skills. And so there are many costs. But in this study, the main costs were mainly nutrition mm -hmm. and transport mm -hmm. that were really identified as very high costs. All right. That is the economic burden of uh, TB. And just to give you a few pointers there, TB is a major public health problem in Kenya, obviously, and it's the fourth cause of death among infectious uh, diseases. Mm -hmm. So why was it necessary to carry out this survey at this particular time? So one of the big reasons, okay, there are quite a number of reasons, but one of the main reasons is that now we want, we have an NTB strategy. Mm -hmm. And it has found that TB, as much as we, as in globally, we have found that as much as TB mm -hmm. is as pre-treatment, we're not treating everybody to completion. We have a lot of people who are falling out of treatment. And so there are many social factors associated with TB, socioeconomic factors. And the NTB strategy, one of the main strategy is that we must, main target is that we must have zero catastrophic costs to families with TB mm -hmm. by 2020. But how do you know how that you have reached zero? You do not first of all to know what is our baseline? How, what is the current cost that the patients are incurring? Mm -hmm. So for that reason, the tuberculosis program decided to carry out a study to find out how much cost do patients incur. And it currently we're also doing another study to find out then what is the healthcare provider 
costs to TB mm -hmm. so that we can get the two sides of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Now, these, this line of thinking that there's a correlation between uh, TB and HIV, is this something that is actually there? Is it a fact or it's just a perception that people have? Let me state that, yes, there's a correlation mm -hmm. in the sense that HIV reduces the immunity of people. Mm -hmm and TB develops as a result of that reduced immunity. So there's a level in which they are related. Mm -hmm. However, following our prevalence survey that we carried out in 2016, we identified that even though we still have patients who have both TB and HIV, 83% of our patients who have TB do not have HIV. And we would like uh, we think that's an important point for all people to realize mm -hmm. that just because they have TB doesn't mean they have HIV. Mm -hmm. That seems to be to have been a big contributor of stigma mm -hmm. in TB patients. Indeed, yeah. Yes, but actually it doesn't not, does not necessarily mean that because you have TB you have HIV. All right. Yes. Um, talk to us about the policy implications from the survey findings that you have. So what this means uh, for us at the policy level. We have learned that social factors and economic factors are affecting treatment access. Mm -hmm. They are impacting on universal health coverage for our TB patients. And they are also impacting on their life generally. So we need to come up with one, social protection mechanisms. How can our patients access social protection? Social protection will include one, um, nutrition support. Mm -hmm. They should be able to access nutrition and not just what we are providing. At the moment, the ministry provides supplements and therapeutic feeding, meaning we only try to improve your, your, your BMI if you are at 16.5 up to around 18.5. Mm -hmm. But that is still low. Mm -hmm. What people need is proper food, ugali, nyama, uh, beans, you know, skuma wiki, fruits. They need to have proper feeding. Mm -hmm. So they need that kind of uh, policy in mm -hmm. place. How do they access food? Mm -hmm. The next thing that we would like them to access is health care at low cost. Mm -hmm. well, what that means is we did a patient pathway analysis and we we're trying to look at when you go to the nearest health care facility, are you going to access diagnosis and are you going to access uh, care, mm -hmm. that is treatment. Mm -hmm. And we discovered that 42% of our patients, when they go to health care facility, they do not get diagnosis on the first visit. That means they'll have to come again and again. Mm -hmm. There is need for a policy change to ensure that any time you get to the healthcare facility, you get screened for TB mm -hmm. and get on to treatment as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Then we reduce that those many visits to the healthcare facility. Mm -hmm. The other cost that we have to consider is that these patients who are who have a job and they have to continue taking treatment will need to be protected from loss of jobs. So we need a workplace policy that protects these people. At the moment, you know, there is within the code of ethics and also in human resource management, you can get days off when you're sick, get a sick off. You can get a, f a prolonged sick off maybe for three months. Mm -hmm. But then after that, your salary starts to come down. So we need to come up with a policy that these patients are protected from loss of jobs. Mm -hmm. And we also need to think about the private sector. So if that worker is not coming to work, what is the what can happen? Mm -hmm. uh, what will happen? The other cost that we have to consider is patients on treatment. We take care of TB drugs, but then the patient will have another complication that is not covered by the TB treatment. For example, with drug-resistant TB patients, the medication they take can resort maybe to some form of renal failure, mm -hmm. to hearing loss, which is the commonest, mm -hmm. and to other co organ problems. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to s also take care of that cost for that complication. Mm -hmm. If you heard the story of one of our patients, they will need ICU care, some of them need surgery, mm -hmm. that cost needs to be taken care of. So mm -hmm. those are some of the areas which we'll be considering when you're looking at our uh, uh, policies. Mm -hmm. But luckily, we have come at a good time when universal health coverage is one of the big four. Exactly. And we see TB patients are going to benefit from b the inclusion of TB in the universal health coverage package mm -hmm. so that we reduce on most of those costs that right. our, our patients are facing. Okay. Yes. I see from one of our viewers here asking for the sake of the viewers, if you could just 
take us through the transmission, the prevention, the treatment, and the follow-up? All right. So and cause as well. So those would be two. <laughs> I would have to take two tracks <laughs> okay. uh, to respond to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and I think that's a good question because we discovered that TB knowledge is not like HIV. A lot mm. of people know about HIV, malaria, but very few people know about TB. Mm. And uh, yeah, so I think this is a good opportunity for them to know about TB. Mm -hmm. So TB is a caused by a bacteria. Uh, we usually call it tuberculosis, mycobacterium. And um, it is uh, mainly affecting the lung. The lung is at the chest. Mm -hmm. And that is for around 80% of the people. But the, it can also go to any other part of the body except hair and nail. And how it, uh, how it is transmitted basically is um, you just need to be breathing in. You continue your normal breathing in when there's someone who is coughing and that person has TB. Mm -hmm. So when someone who has TB coughs, they are going to uh, produce some droplets with bacteria. And if they did not cover their mouth, they are going to transmit that bacteria to you when you breathe in. And when you breathe in, it doesn't mean that you get TB immediately. Some people take for, stay with that bacteria with them, within them for a long time. But others develop TB within the first two weeks, es the first two years, especially children under the age of five. Mm -hmm. And, um, but when your immunity goes down, then you develop the proper TB disease, mm -hmm. which will most likely present as cough. It will present with you losing weight. It will also present with you having fever, and then also um, chest pain. And the one that people will most likely know, rem always remember is that I'm sweating a lot at night, or when I cough, I produce uh, kikozi with sputum. Yes, yeah, sputum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's a common <laughs> language, yeah. but the, yeah, the sputum that comes out has mm -hmm. some blood. Mm -hmm. So that's those are the main common ones. Of course, there are others that uh, you, if it's the part of the body, maybe you have. Uh, TB of the brain, which we call it meningitis. TB meningitis, you'll just feel sleepy, drowsy, you're losing weight, you're confused. So you have mental status is changing. If you have the back, TB of the spine, you start having back aches. So they're de depending on where it is. Mm -hmm. There's a common one which appears around the neck, like, uh, like looks like tonsillitis or mumps, mm -hmm. and that's also a very common one. It will appear around the neck. You just see a swelling on the neck and it's as a tip. So we also test that one. So those are some of the common forms of TB. So how do we diagnose TB? So for both drug resistance and for TB, uh, both of them have the same symptoms, same transmission. The only difference comes in if I breathe in a bacteria that, is re that does not respond to the current treatment we are using for TB then I have drug resistance. Mm -hmm. If I breathe, I inhale a bacteria that respo can respond to the treatment we have currently, that is mainly two drugs in the current treatment. One mm -hmm. is called rifampicin, and the second one is called isoniazid. Mm -hmm. Then I have drug sensitive TB. If I'm not resistant to those two, mm -hmm. most likely I have drug sensitive. If I'm resistant to those two, I have drug resistant TB. Mm -hmm. And so the diagnosis in Kenya, we have decided to go for the identifying that bacteria in the sputum or from the sample, if we collect a sample from the neck or a specimen from where you have uh, the symptoms. Mm -hmm. Then um, we use a machine called GeneXpert. So we want patients to know that there's this machine called GeneXpert and diagnosis is made within two hours from the time you produce the mm -hmm. sputum. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we treat? Treatment is mainly six months for the ones who have drug sensitive TB. Mm -hmm. The ones with drug resistant TB, mm -hmm. it can vary from nine months up to 20 months, mm -hmm. depending on what, what you're resistant to. Mm -hmm. The six month treatment is you take tablets on a daily basis mm -hmm. for the whole total treatment. And we keep monitoring you for, to look at whether you're sput there's still bacteria in the sputum. While for the drug resistant TB, you take injections for a minimum of four months a maximum of eight months. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it can go up to 12 months still, depending on how, what you're resistant to. I, and that one, um, right, uh, luckily though, mm -hmm. for the drug resistant TB, we are also going short in a few, maybe in one year, 
we should be now going to purely oral and get rid of the injection because the injection is one that is causing us a lot of side effects. All right. Yes. Um, James from Dandora is saying, I spent over 85,000 on TB treatment this year. I never thought that TB is common among sportsmen and women until I went for screening. Is this something that you know you get very often? Actually, the TB is common among young men. Young men? Between the age of 15 and 34. Mm -hmm. That's why we're expecting TB. And now we have come up with policies that are actually trying to target what do we do for these young men. But why is it common between that age bracket? Socioeconomic factors. Mm -hmm. This is the age group where they have to go out and work. They are more likely to be found in crowded places. Mm -hmm. If you look at young men when they come to Nairobi, where are they more likely to live? Uh, more like they don't have an income, so they will go and start living in the um, informal sec sector. And in those informal settlements, you're not so sure of the ventilation, mm -hmm. how many people are living in one house. From stories we have heard, some people, even are young men who live 10 in a house to take care of the cost. So if one of them must TB, they just most likely transmit. Mm -hmm. These are people most likely also not able to access healthcare. One of the things you realize, young people rarely go to hospital, especially at that age. If I'm a young man who has a job in an uh, industrial area, for example, I step, I'll be at work by 8 and I will leave at 5. Mm -hmm. The hospital opens at 8 and closes at 5. So my opportunity to get to the healthcare is also missing. Mm. So about the sports, um, I don't think it's more common among the sports. I just think it's because of the age group. And now we are identifying areas where we'll find these young men. So we'll go where there are sports, like there's a football club, we'll go there because we'll more likely find young men. We'll go where there is a bar, we'll more find the young men. Mm -hmm. So it's just where the young men are, not necessarily sports people. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, I see there's a target that you have set for by 2020 that, you know, this, uh, as we're saying, the cost burden should not be as catastrophic. What are the deliberate measures that you as a, are taking as an institution to ensure that at least in the next two years, things will have changed? So we started working on a number of areas to reduce the cost to the patient. One of the costs that we started is um, for the drug-resistant TB, we provide them with transport at a rate of 200 shillings per day, a total of 6,000 per month. We realized this might not be adequate. When we had set this target, it was based on the minimum wage that was set by the country. Now that it has been revised, we will be forced to also revise it so that our patients actually have adequate mm -hmm. amount of money mm -hmm. to get to the hospital and also use that money to procure food. Mm -hmm. We are providing nutrition supplement and therapeutic feeds that had, as I had mentioned, but that is also not what you would say is adequate. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we are doing now, we are also providing NHIF cover for our drug resistant TB patients. Mm -hmm. We are working with the Ministry of Health under the UHC cover mm -hmm. to ensure that we also include TB patients and expand that cover. As you know, the minimum cover for NHIF only covers um, basic healthcare, but for our TB patients, they will need more slightly more advanced health mm -hmm. level of healthcare mm -hmm. than what is provided. Mm -hmm. So that process has already started. We've already provided our package to the universal health coverage team so that they can consider our TB patients. Mm -hmm. The other thing we do is uh, monthly monitoring of a TB patient has a cost. So we have a cost for lab tests. We have identified a donor through USID mm -hmm. who is supporting us to ensure that that cost is taken care of. So they don't pay to go for every monthly test we take care of that cost. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there are some, of course, there'll be a few costs that we have not taken care of, for especially for the patients who just have TB but not drug-resistant TB. Even though you notice that even with drug-resistant TB, having taken care of most of those costs, they still have the highest amount of costs. Mm -hmm. We need to decentralize their treatment to the nearest facility to home so that they come uh, less frequently. And the other thing we are going to do is adopt oral medication so that they don't have to come every day to the healthcare facility, but we can have maybe a CHW, or who is a, in other words, a community health worker mm -hmm. or a volunteer, go and observe the treatment in their home. So they don't have to actually leave their, their home to come every day to the healthcare facility. That will also reduce massively on their costs. Mm -hmm. 
for, for transport. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things we are doing. We are working with Social Protection and uh, Ministry of Labor mm -hmm. so that we see how we can c take care of the workplace policy mm -hmm. and also social protection mechanisms. That All right. Place. Let's um, just finally take a look at the stigma situation. And, you know, you've always heard TB, Natiba, but then there is a real problem when it comes to stigma. What can be done to change that or, you know, at least just make it a more comfortable environment for those people who have TB? Maybe I give you a story give of a, story. a patient. <laughs> okay. So this patient is found to have drug-resistant TB. Mm -hmm. He lives behind a shop. You know the way we have a, b a at the front is a shop, but at the back there are rentals. And one time the healthcare workers arrive with masks to see the patient. After that, all the p neighbors moved out and the shop had to close because there's someone with TB. What? Yes, so that's how bad stigma is. We have couples that have been left by their spouse. Uh, their a wife is left by a husband, or the husband is left by the wife because they have TB. So stigma is real. What can we do about stigma? The first thing I see is important is the community first needs education mm -hmm. on TB. Because the TB is not infectious for long. It's just you need to start treatment within the first two weeks of treatment, you're no longer infectious. At least for most cases, you're no longer infectious. So as long as someone is on treatment, you're not worried about transmission. Mm -hmm. And we need to have that information passed to as many people as possible. Then we just need to ensure that maybe for these two weeks, we give them a few days, they take treatment, and they come back to work and continue. At home, we need to educate families. We have a package for t educating families on infection prevention. How do you prevent transmission from one person to the other? Mm -hmm. So we have educated them about ventilation, having the person sit outside, allow the person to have a mask, a simple mask. And I think also as a country, we need to stop looking at someone with a mask with that look mm -hmm. in that bus and feel like you should drop out. There are people walking to a matatu with a mask and everybody gets out. And that affects them. So the next time they get into a matatu, they would rather infect you than have them mask. Mm -hmm. So we also need to look at ourselves that, um, and consider our own security. Do we want those people to transmit disease to us? No. So we need to look at that mask as a form of security to us and the goodwill on their part. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you are a patient walking around with a mask, it's not comfortable. But they want to protect the community. Mm -hmm. We want people to open windows when they are matured and allow proper ventilation. So that if there's someone coughing, you're not so at, at such a high risk like that person who had closed windows. And then also the other thing that we want to educate people on is um, if you notice someone is coughing, allow them to, be vi to see a doctor or let them go to the nearest vicinity. They just need to have those symptoms we have mentioned and they will be screened. Mm -hmm. That means we have saved you from getting the disease and we have saved that person from transmitting to others. Mm -hmm. So the more information we pass, I think it will reduce stigma over time. Mm -hmm. Even now, as you see, HIV is no longer as stigmatized as was before mm -hmm. because of the information passed. TB still remains a mystery to many people and that's why it still has the stigma. The sooner we talk about it, the better. And we ask more people with TB to come out and talk about what they went through and how they have managed and that it's curable. Yeah, so I think that's important information. 36% uh, um, you know, of patients with TB according to the survey experience social exclusion. Now, as much as um, you're saying there's an effort towards educating the public, what does this mean for them, for the patients? Because wouldn't that then lead to other things like depression, suicide perhaps? Yes, and also some drugs also lead to suicide and, I say, and mental mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. So yes, a lot of our patients suffer a lot of exclusion. So what we have noticed they do is uh, when they come to hospital, they use a different name. So today I'm Kamene Kimenye, but when I go to the hospital, I'm Mary Mwanyambura. Mm. So that helps me protect my image, mm -hmm. especially from people who know me. When I talk about my disease, I don't say I have TB. I just say, I think it might be asthma. I think it's mm -hmm. allergy. Mm -hmm. So they have to keep on going around in circles to protect their image. And so a lot of people hide. And we don't want people to hide because they have TB. TB is not a curse. It is just a disease like diabetes, like hypertension. So let's be open about it. It means a lot when someone has TB. 
already taking the medication itself, it takes a toll on them. Mm -hmm. So we do have to work on improving, even on the self-image. And one of the patients says, when I say I have TB, it helps another person who has TB come out, and then it reduces the stigma. The biggest stigma is not only outside, but also within me. Mm -hmm. I have TB, so I start to have stigma on myself. Mm -hmm. So we also need to encourage people and create education when the patients come to the healthcare facility. So that when they come, they are not afraid to say they have TB. That is um, information we also have to empower the patients with. Mm -hmm. You have TB, inform people about it and what you can do to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. Over time, even the patients will also start to accept what they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, we have a response here. Someone uh, called Kennedy Chepkonga Katebe says, "Congratulations, Dr. Kamene. Very clear information about TV, a uh, TB rather. I have learned a lot." And someone says, "Hi, Jack. I just tuned in now. I'm on TB tabs for six months." And I'm on my fourth month today. Mm. I'm asking if it's wrong to detox with ginger, garlic, and lemon in the morning after taking my meds at night. So I, d I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, detoxing. Mm -hmm. I, from what I'm hearing, she's going to take lemon, ginger, mm -hmm. and that's what we take every day. My question would be, uh, what is she would really need to take that advice from a clinician because if she wants to do detox, is this sh she's trying to lose weight? Or what would be the reason for the detox? I, what is her current weight? How does that affect you know, her absorption? How will it affect her absorption of drugs? They will need to discuss with the healthcare worker right at the clinic mm -hmm. because the healthcare worker knows the history of this patient over the last four months mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. but right now making the decision when the patient we don't know what are the other factors around it i might say yes but then then what mm -hmm. when they go maybe they have they might use the advice mm -hmm. of the calf so i would suggest because they are seen on a monthly basis just go for the next clinic and discuss it with your with your healthcare work. All right, and someone else is asking, is TB treatment free? The drugs are free. We give the drugs for TB for free. Mm -hmm. We also have a subsidized program in the private sector. Mm -hmm. So yes, TB treatment for public sector is public and mission hospitals is free. Mm -hmm. Diagnosis for TB is also free, mm -hmm. yes. The only thing we are working on is the chest x-ray so that the chest x-ray costs can also be taken care of by the government mm -hmm. yes all right